I'm here to produce the speaker, Amy Marie, and her, she's doing a presentation on Firefox OS and its uses for Linux. Okay, I have a small disclaimer to put, um, and I'm really sorry, Dietrich and the Firefox guys, because I've got a capital F in Firefox and there shouldn't be, but oh well. <laughs> so just to let you guys know that. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, basically, what I want to just give a little brief chat about is the architecture in Firefox OS and looking at uh, its use of the kernel and how packets, etc., get passed up through it and back down. Um, and a little bit on where our code base lives and how you can contribute and stuff, but a little bit less on that. To give you a quick introduction, my name is Amy Marie Forstrom. Um, I've been using I used Slackware when I was a kid, but I really think my first use of Linux was probably with Debian Potato. Um, I've contributed to various um, OSS web projects. Uh, a lot of things that I do is mentor children uh, with Python and Scratch. And I've contributed to Migo and Qt, uh, which led me to the Firefox OS trail. And recently I was doing some stuff with Mozilla um, on the Firefox OS support team. So now this is going to be interesting because I've got to, sorry. So what is Firefox OS? Well, by now you've probably heard about Firefox OS. Hi. All right, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> by now you've probably heard about Firefox OS. It's been out in the wild for just probably about over a year and a half, coming into two years. First started life as the B2G project, AKA Boot to Gecko. It's still referred to B2G in GitHub. It's Mozilla's attempt at entering the mobile platform area. Uh, it is aimed at lower end smartphones. But this is not a limiting factor. It doesn't mean that you can't roll it onto your Nexus 5 or Nexus 4 or put it in higher end phones. Uh, it is built with web standards and a big thing, uh, open web standards, and a huge difference about the Firefox OS approach is that there is a marketplace, but you don't have to put your apps on the marketplace. You can host your apps on your own GitHub, you can host them on your own website, and people can download them and use it from that. So you're not restricted into the marketplace model that Apple and the Microsofts restrict you into. So let's just jump into the actual layers. This is going to be a bit tricky because I'm kind of losing my pointer. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so basically what we're looking at here is what I like to call the three Gs. And then under those layers, we have the actual mobile device itself. So at the top, you've got Gaia. Gecko and then Gonk. Gonk is your Linux kernel. Gecko is Gecko. <laughs> and Gaia is where your applications are sitting and running. From a security perspective, each layer, each application runs in its own sandboxed environment within Gaia. But we will actually go through and have a look at that deeper. What's that? Yeah, I'm just, I'm on two different screens. Sorry, my speaker notes got a bit corrupted. Um, so basically, Gaia is a user interface application for Firefox OS. Comes with the standard stack of applications, phone caller, messaging apps, contacts, calendar, etc. When you roll your own Firefox Gaia, will be will include the basic stack of common applications in it as well. So you'll have your basic marketplace and etc. And Gaia communicates to Gonk through the Gecko layer. So what is Gecko? Ah, all right. Hey, sorry, all right, I'm gonna work this out in a second now. I've got it, cool. So at the top we have, Gecko holds basically all out where our web APIs are running from. So Gecko is the application runtime of Firefox OS and implements the standards for HTML, CSS, and JS. Gecko is considered the middleware code, which is comprised, among others, of a networking stack, a graphic stack, a layout engine, and the virtual machine for running the JavaScript code. Oh, 
Gonk. So Gonk is a Linux kernel. It holds a device drivers, it holds a HAL, it's isolated from, Ge from Gaia, communicates through Gecko and BTG, and you could kind of call it, in a sense, a magic black box. It's isolated from the higher levels, and it's all communicating through web APIs. So it's a core component that is adapted for different differing chipsets as well, and we'll go into this a little bit more. So each device that you're going to have is going to really pretty much have its own version of Gonk rolled onto it. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into it. So we're looking at some of the com components in the Gonk layer. What we can see is we've got the radio interface layer, the RAL, which interacts with the modem hardware in the phone. This consists of two components. So you've got the daemon and then you've also got the proxy. The proxy messages between the daemon and the B2G process. There is a media server in there which controls audio and video playback. Gecko communicates to the media server through the Android RPC mechanism and also a NetD process, aka the networking daemon, which then talks to the networking stack. Bluetooth and other service level daemons providing access to the hardware capabilities. These are pretty much your common modules, but obviously there's going to be a lot more in there. The Linux kernel distro also utilizes libraries from Android, the GPS camera, and some other open source projects, LibUSB, BlueZ, et cetera, to name some through. And then we have the firmware and drivers at the lowest level. Now, how Gonk handles a request? Thank you. So as we discussed, Guy speaks to Gecko, and a single request from Gecko can trigger a complex series of operations initiated and managed by Gonk and the device. In this example, what we're seeing here is a radio interface layer in Gonk responsible for controlling the modem hardware that will dial through the requested number onto the radio interface daemon itself. The B2G process then communicates the dial request through the proxy, which forwards this onto the service level daemon. The daemon controls the actual modem hardware and via the Linux kernel and any associated modem firmware drivers and devices. The RLD sets up the modem and causes it to dial the number and any changes in the modem state, aka ringing, dialing, stopping the call, cancelling, hanging up, are then reported through the BT2G process through the stack. So if we take a little bit more of a look into how they actually communicate. All right, so here we're actually looking at the full stack of layers. So as mentioned, Guy is where the application will live. The app communicates to Gecko through the execution environment, which in turn talks to the permissions manager, who is the only able to access the web APIs to the underlying hardware. So this goes through, checks through the ACL, so we've got your access control list checks that you actually have the permissions and what credentials you're running, passes it through the web API, to the IR hardware, to the boot to Gecko, and then down into the Gonk. Gonk communicates to device. Now, the reason that you're looking at these all separate is because they really are separate layers in the sense that you're not going to ever get Gonk going straight into Gaia. It does have to go through this full process. All right, so let's look at the how. So, within Gonk, since the hardware extraction layer, now this is one of the, called the porting layers of Gecko. It's C++ API. This hardware abstraction layer is not exposed directly to JavaScript code into the Gecko for obvious security reasons. The sandbox implementation simply proxies requests by content processes them and then forwards them onto the Gecko server process. The proxy requests are sent using the IPDL which we will discuss later. So if we jump into having a look at our init process. So our init process is basically stock Android. Um, so the init RC is basically stock Android with patches to include things that are required to kickstart the Firefox OS. So they're very specific to Firefox OS. Therefore, device to device is going to really depend, depending on the needs of the actual device. After the inner processor running Gonk handles 
<coughs> sorry, handles mounting required file systems and spawns system services. After init is ran, a user space init process is launched. Once the init process is launched, the kernel handles system calls from the user space and interrupts from the hardware. After that, it stays around to serve as a process manager, which is very similar to other Unix-like operating systems in that sense. So the init D that you're seeing there is pretty much the same across most POSIX systems. So if we have a look a little bit into the bootstrap. All right. So execution always begins at the primary bootloader. From there, a succession of increasingly high level bootloaders are called. The general system boot up flow goes from the bootloaders in the kernel space to the init in the native code to the B2G. It then spawns the window, system window manager and then executes the home screen. All your applications then run within the home screen as well there. So they're isolated there. So every time an app runs, this process goes through, home screen is called, and that's the process that your apps are executed on top of. So uh, I mentioned before IPDL, and if you're not, um, if you haven't kind of developed with Firefox and you or Mozilla, you might not be fully aware of it. It's the Interprocess Communication Protocol Definition Language. Uh, it was developed by Mozilla. It's C++ code, and it's basically a way to pass secure processes and threads in a secure way. So app, all apps communicate with the service level daemons via the IPC. So now if we jump and have a look into the IPC architecture. So in Firefox OS, we have a multi-process architecture. This means that each app is actually run in its own process. As you can see, there's a single parent process called B2G. The parent process spawns newer, which is the child. Then newer then spawns the apps. <coughs> As mentioned, the default child process run with the most minimal set of pri privileges. So B2G parent has the higher privileges, it executes newer, newer then runs down to the apps and that's where you're having those lower levels of permissions. When higher privileges are needed, you're going back up through to the B2G process and then back down to see if those are allowed to, have, to be have. Hopefully some of this is making a bit of sense. It will pull, I'll pull it together in a minute. So IPC parent-child relationships. So if you're familiar with using Unix sockets, then this system will not seem unfamiliar to you. Firefox OS uses Unix sockets created with a socket pair system to call and send messages. The system calls send message and receive message each time. Each process has its own dedicated thread and handles that socket operations. This is called an I.O. loop. Each I.O. loop thread has its own outgoing message queue. So, as you can see from there, all IPDL messages are sent between the parent and child endpoints, aka actors. An IPDL protocol declares how the actors communicate and it declares the possible messages that may be sent in a state machine describing what messages are allowed to be sent back. So as we said before, the apps really only access via web APIs. Gecko is the sole gateway to the mobile device. So there's no native API, no back doors, and the apps all run, as we saw before, in a sandbox mode. So this means that Gecko really does provide that sole gateway. So this kind of jumps us into looking into some sandboxing and the security. So we can see from this diagram that sandboxes use IPC to trust as a trust boundary for communications to the parent process. Each app, aka child process, communicates to the parent process using the trust boundary, Firefox OS. And this is similar, okay, so this parent process and how this trust boundary is happening with the IPDO IPC and the sandboxing is similar, exactly the same as how Firefox OS runs on Linux. Like Firefox, sorry, Firefox desktop browser runs on Linux. All right, so now we've kind of had our heads dumped with a bunch of things. Let's jump back into our layers again. 
So as we can see, the gecko parent-child relationship is started at the higher levels. And note the communication to the lower levels need to go through the permissions manager to gain access to the lower levels in the gecko layer. Like, hopefully not boring everybody. <laughs> So, gone. so what parts of the kernel? So, um, and I've got ASAP wrong there, sorry. So basically, um, it's pretty much an Android kernel. So it's got the users, as we said before, it's using Android libraries, it's got the GPS, it's using camera, et cetera, but it's also got an extra bunch of Mozilla components in it. These changes are not upstreamed to the Android project, they are unique to the Firefox OS project. It is a very basic Linux kernel, um, and it's, as I said, it's not the full Android, so it's done so as well to really provide a smaller memory footprint, which is really important when you're running low-end devices, $25, $35 devices. So what is Gonk in a sense? It's basically what we call our porting layer of Gecko. So Gonk has full control, Gecko has full control over Gonk. Difference in the exposures of the interfaces. And that in saying that, that there's a port of Gecko to Gonk just like there is a port of Gecko to OS X, as there is a port of Gecko to Windows in the Firefox browser code. <coughs> Since the Firefox OS project has full control over Gonk, we can expose interfaces to Gonk, to Gecko, that cannot be exposed on other systems. And an example of this is the Telefony stack. Um, obviously, if you're running Firefox browser, you don't need access to a Telefony stack, uh, so whereas in a mobile phone you do. So it's slightly different in that sense as to how the browser executes it. So Gonk is covered under the Mozilla Public License. Being mobile devices, um, it also contains proprietary drivers as well. Vendors can modify the kernel. They can upstream if they choose. OEMs will also create, as we said, device drivers, firmware, and et cetera, which will not be upstreamed. They will be specific to the telecom provider, the device manufacturer. So implementing changes in GOC. So as we discussed, certain aspects of the Firefox OS architecture and also certain components of Gonk, we could take a look at the process when people and companies need to make changes to Gonk. When specific functionality is required in Gonk, this needs to be added by the ODM or the OEM, the company, the human, aka you. This means that Gonk will need to be extended and the how files modified to expose new functionality to access device specific requirements. An important part of this process is what we went through before, which is the IPC, the IPDL, because that will need to be designed for when you're actually adding new changes in there. Integrating it into Gecko. So you might expose hardware functionality not currently accessible via web APIs in Gecko. So there's a particular thing that you want to get into there. So first you expose the functionality in Gonk, that's when you modify the Gecko source to extend the web APIs. So you're adding those driver sets and what you need into Gonk itself, but then you actually have to extend Gecko to have those web APIs to be able to talk up through Gaia. Now I'm not really going to talk too much about licensing issues because it's not really a licensing talk. Um, but as we said, there's proprietary code in there. OEMs must sign licensing agreements with the component suppliers. There's proprietary code in it, um, which is unfortunately something you can't get away from when you're dealing with mobile phones. But who is actually responsible for the gonk? So Mozilla is responsible for the gonk. Due to this, Mozilla maintains the source repositories and any needed support files. It is maintained under, as we said before, the Mozilla Public License. Therefore, you can fork it, you can clone it, and you can do what you like to it. The upstream process is not as straightforward as one would like it to be, though. Um, 
And this is due to the fact that there are also a lot of third party components and et cetera that cannot be included in the Mozilla repos. As with Android, it is at the discretion of Mozilla if they wish to take up your code. So it's not that you can't upstream things back to them. You can contact release managers and you can speak to them, but it's not the simplest upstream process. Oops. So as we said, it's pretty tricky to navigate the land of mobiles because of chipsets. So third parties and gonk, you know, really, it's ensuring that se you've got to be really ensuring that seamless communication between gonk and the Gaia levels, which is where you're looking at the IPDL and the IPC. So it really, in a sense, falls to third parties to maintain their own stack. Brings us into the, the question of blockers. So your upstream process is not guaranteed. There is proprietary drivers that will never see the light of the upstream, which means that fragmentation starts to occur. Each OEM device owner person can maintain their own fork of Firefox OS. So, and fragmentation is a huge problem. It's a huge problem in the Android world. It's also becoming a really big problem um, in the Firefox OS world. So you're looking at probably about 60% of devices out there. At the last time I checked, which was about four months ago, that are still running 1.1. Mozilla itself is working on three. So to give you an idea, 1.1 doesn't have copy and paste. <laughs> So unfortunately, it starts to become a bit of a thing where, yes, okay, I've got my CTE Movistar device, but Movistar is only pushing 1.1 and it will be at the discretion of Movistar if they actually want to push down three. Mozilla is working with the telecoms guys to get around that process and to look at ways of kind of alleviating a little bit of that, but it's not the simplest thing. So, which is what we said, always limitations. The interesting thing about the Mozilla project is, so if you're looking at uh, Firefox OS, if you look at Android, um, I'm just taking a stab here, but I'm gonna say there's probably a good couple of hundred people, probably thousands working on the support of that device. We had a team of six of us that were providing support and we had an army of volunteers. So, it can be hard to provide support. It's really hard when you've got 60% of the people out there on a 1.1 and the problems that they're talking about have already been fixed in the newer versions. There's not really too much you can do for them at that level. So it's frustrating. It's really frustrating because if, you know, you think of the end user who isn't necessarily technical, they've got their phone, they're running 1.3, their friend's got their device, they're running three, their friend can copy and paste, they can't. Um, the ca the, you know, they've got a better type interface than their friends. And I guess that's kind of where the frustration comes in. But in saying that, that's no difference to what happens in the Android marketplace as well. But the really fun thing and the really cool thing that you can do is you can make it what you want to, right? So it actually isn't too hard to flash a device. There is a lot of support and a lot of information out there that would t tell you how to flash your own device. So if you do have 1.1, you can get onto the repos and upgrade that and flash that yourself. <coughs> so as we said, it's based on the Android kernel which is hopefully going to make it easier to port to existing device drivers, firmware, service demons, and other components. Supported device list can be found in the repo, the b2g slash config.sh. It's pretty much where all the list of devices there. And if yours isn't there, you can go in and add it yourself, and you can add the drivers and et cetera you need. Um, a great example of that is the APC project, and I'll show you a little APC soon. How to contribute. So everything's kept in GitHub. So you can go into GitHub, you can fork it, you can download it, you can contribute into it. If you go into gonk-misc, it's pretty much the best place to go if you want to look specifically at the gonk files. 
cool toys and future projects. Um, so Mozilla is very heavily invested into Firefox OS. So recently, last year, they stated a, a partnership with Panasonic. So Panasonic Smart TVs will be running Firefox OS. There's an APC device that I've got there. Um, APC itself comes with a, a version of Firefox OS. I've been using that at home as my main media center. There is some bugs and issues with that. There's a repo for the APC. If you can get on and you squash a bug, they will send you an APC device, which is pretty cool. So more mobile platforms. Well, choice is good. Being a monopoly is bad for everybody. Linux was made from better devices. So, you know, do we need, there's always a question, do we need another mobile platform? Yes, we do need another mobile platform. I'd like to see another 30 mobile platforms. I don't see why choice is a bad thing. I don't see why we need to have one, two or three. Um, if you really are into playing with embedded devices and wanting to have a go, I would also tell you to check out the Yocto project. Yocto project, you can roll your own embedded Linux and you can start to kind of get around and play with the architecture set there. Tizen. This time I can actually get to say Tizen is going to be releasing, Samsung's going to be releasing a Tizen device soon and um, straight away you're going to be able to run Android apps on the Tizen platform which kind of gets away the need of having a full Tizen marketplace there. The other thing about uh, the apps in Firefox OS as well as you can run them on your Android device. So you can actually, if you've got an Android device, you can go to the Firefox Marketplace and you can run it on there. What you will notice when you do that is because of how you're running it and because you're running it in a HTML5 space, you're actually not accessing a lot of the permissions, so you're bypassing that. So your application then doesn't have access to the full stack in your Android phone. So if you use Twitter from the Firefox OS Marketplace, you're not going to be giving it access to that full layer stack that you've got on Android. But if you use the Android Twitter app, you are. So now I've, I've really raced through that a bit quickly and I've probably haven't made all the best sense. So I'm gonna kind of put out for questions or I'm gonna ask if people want me to explain a little bit more of the architecture, go into the IPC a bit more or Um, very, very quickly, sorry, and off topic, uh, you mentioned Scratch. I'm really interested in that. Where can I catch up with you about that today? Um, Where, if you see me walking, come and grab me and ask me. Will, will you be around? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll be around. But yeah, so I want to keep the questions awesome. to five hundred. Awesome. Um, and <laughs> in regard to the, um, the problem of um, updating the device and the, the vendors don't you know, update the devices. Um, Google has been uh, getting around that by sort of fixing the sort of lower layers and then pushing all of the sort of user visible functionality into packages that they push out and control. Uh, maybe that would be useful for Firefox OS. Um, as I said, Mozilla is in, uh, I don't, like, as I said, I was doing Firefox OS support, um, and Mozilla, the higher levels of Mozilla are in communications and working out these things with the, with the telecoms. Uh, it's really only been around in the wild for about a year or so, so it's really kind of just picking up speed now and getting greater adoption. So I think as you see that greater adoption, and as it becomes a more important mobile player, as well, then you'll probably see the telecoms and that working a lot closer. All right. When I think of Mozilla, I think about its commitment to, to open software, to control, user control and such. Here you've described a platform that's very much based on proprietary drivers and proprietary code and facilitating that kind of, of setup and that leads to all kinds of pathologies, a number of which you listed yourself. Now we've gotten around these sorts of issues in other markets when vendors insisted on free drivers for the, for the hardware they were supporting. Why is Mozilla not doing that for Firefox OS? And what is being done to get us away from this problem of binary blobs in our free systems? Same problem exists in the Android world. 
right? Same problem exists in the Android world because it comes down to the device manufacturers themselves. So there is really, um, now I haven't looked at the full Tizen stack yet, but I'm going to guarantee you that there's proprietary code in that Tizen stack as well. Um, and it's just, it's currently a big problem within the mobile world and a lot of it does come down to those device manufacturers and telecoms. So it's a lot more, I guess, fragmented in that sense. Um, I can't speak for what Mozilla's doing personally to get around that because I'm really here to just talk to you and present the architecture. It's, yeah, it's, um, there's really not much I can say about that, sorry. Um, getting back to the architecture, I hope it's not too an impertinent question. Just in terms of the Gecko um, and Gonk layers, like Gonk keeps a lot of um, Android user space. And um, in Gecko, things like the permission manager and other kind of abstractions seem very similar to, to, the, um, fra to the Android framework. So I was wondering, like, how much of a win was it, especially if you're already um, shipping and maintaining Fennec and not able to make large reuse of um, the work you're doing in Fennec and in um, Firefox OS because you, you're not working to the Android layer like you, like you're not, you're not using the functionality of the Android framework for things like IPC, which you'd get for free if you'd kept at least part of the Android framework. So I was wondering, like, how... I'm trying to get, I'm trying to see the question you're asking. So I'm yeah. just wondering, like, uh, how much, um, I guess, work goes into maintaining all the extra bits in uh, the Gecko layer for Firefox OS, which you don't need on other OSs that, say, Fennec doesn't need because Android's framework provides all that. So you're basically sort of doubling up what the... OS is on your desktop and um, Android so framework so there, already provides. Yeah, so well, I mean, in the sense that there's a Gecko port for Firefox OS, there's a Gecko for port for your Windows browser, for your OS X, for Linux, etc. So um, I'm not sure I'm kind of totally getting well, that I mean, question I mean, though. I don't have a permission no, and that's where it's yeah. So that's where it's different because it needs to be different because on an operating system level and etc. You don't want to be accessing those lower level threads. You don't need to be accessing that, and you want to keep that uh, everything fully away from that. So that is where it is different in that sense of yeah, it does and can get into the light, the light, lower levels of that kernel, which it's not doing on your operating system because it doesn't need to. Um, how harder is it to maintain or how much work goes into it? The same way as porting, the same way as, you know, there's a Gecko port for Windows, there's a Gecko port for, like, it's just, yeah. yeah I, just I think I'm, I don't know. Well, I just meant that Fennec already had all that infrastructure that you could have just reused if you hadn't got rid of the um, Delphic and the Android framework from Firefox OS. Yeah. We have another question. I didn't design the architecture. <laughs> So from an application developer's perspective, your code is all running in the JavaScript engine in the browser. Yes. And so if I was to bundle up an app, what's, what's the contents of the app and like are there tools in order to assist in building them? Um, like if, what, what does an application look like to be distributed either via the market or linked to from my web page? Okay, so you're, you're basically, when you're writing the app there, you've, it's pretty much a HTML5, JavaScript, CSS application. So it is, in a sense, you're using full open web standards there. So it's, it's not like, okay, I'm developing for Android, I need to learn Android's code base. iOS, I need to learn iOS's code base, etc. So it's done in the way to lower the entry barriers as well. So now all of a sudden, all I need to do is equip you with HTML, CSS and JS knowledge and you can write an application that's going to sit on top of that and because you don't have to go through that marketplace as well it means that if I want to make my own to-do app I can just quickly write an HTML5 to-do app and push it onto my device so it does Great and if, it's, if you're providing a set of APIs and you're only using a subset that doesn't call to say the telephone I could also run that on my Firefox browser Yes, you can, exactly, yeah. So you can run it on your desktop. Um, you can run it on a Windows Surface, which actually has HTML5. Um, so yeah, you can, it's not just restricting you to the Firefox OS. So as I said, right now you can get on your Android, get into the marketplace and start downloading applications and running them there. Um, and you will find the biggest difference you will find is that is the permissions. 
that it's actually accessing in your phone. And the other lovely thing that a lot of people love about it is there is an actual option in the operating system to say do not track, which I don't think any other mobile operating system has. Um, another question uh, leading on from this, um, it seems to me that this has the potential to be the perfect universal app platform for any phone, like, uh, you know, if you write an Android app, it only works on Android, you write a Firefox OS app, it can run on any phone that has Firefox, the only problem yes. being, like you said, you lack access to those various APIs like location or, uh, I don't know, whatever APIs on the phone. So my question is, are you going to develop Firefox um, for Android and for iOS and implement access to all of the phone APIs so that a Firefox OS app has sort of um, equal status running on Firefox OS or on Android or on iOS? So this could become a universal app platform with full access to all of those phone APIs. The awesome and lovely thing about Mozilla and Firefox OS is that it's using open web standards. So if Apple decides to implement HTML5, <laughs> then you could run your app on, on that. Um, it's not that... You know, like, I, I think it's that you've misunderstood it a little bit in the sense that, you know, when you said you can't access location and GPS and et cetera, you can, and you are. You're just accessing it through the gecko layer. But you mentioned that... So you're um, doing it with... So it's a little bit different in the sense of... And, and as we said, because, as I said before, if you're wanting to add new things into it, that's when you're going into Gonk, you're going into the C++, that HAL, and you're going into those lower levels and adding those additional things that you need there. Then you go into Gecko and you expose those additional web API calls there. Right. So you do have that. Um, but as I said, it is their HTML5 apps, so you can run it across. You mentioned, platforms. for ex example, that the Twitter app, the Firefox OS Twitter app running on Android would not have the same access to APIs as the native Android. Okay, so Twitter what I app. mean by that is, is when you're running, why the hell does my Twitter application need to have access to 25 different areas of my phone? If you download, a lot of these applications don't need the level of permissions. When we're doing mobile app development, we've come into this state of ask for every single permission by default. So a lot of Android applications will ask you for everything by default, not that they need it. And it's also a problem when you're in the mobile app development world, as I said, people have just got into doing that by default. So it's not that you're not able to talk to the level there. It's, you don't need to be accessing that. You're running it. It's the same way as if you're in Twitter on a web browser, it doesn't need to go down and communicate with lower levels of your kernel. So your point it's running is the, in that the, user the, space, that's where it needs to run. So the user experience running native Android Twitter versus Firefox OS Twitter on Android is the same? User experience is the same. You're not as lacking anything, I no. see. No. Any other questions? Oh, couple there, Yeah, I'm sort of all new to this, so a, a number of questions pop up actually. So let's say you're a web app trying to access something in the, blue, uh, in the Bluetooth stack. Has the API to that been standardised across the world? Like seeing what Bluetooth MAC addresses are out there that you can talk to? What do you mean by that? Has the API been standardised across the world? That's a uh, Well, OK, question. a location API. What position am I at now? The web app wants to know that. Is that the same on all platforms? I presume it's a JavaScript call. Is, it, is the parameters the same? The return values the You're same? You're asking me to tell you if that's the same across all platforms is not something that, that I could do because I haven't played with it across all mobile platforms. <laughs> well, it's the same across all platforms. <laughs> yeah, but it's well, using... Yeah. So okay. all the, as I said, it's, you know, as we all know, Mozilla is very strong in the 
um, web standards. The other great thing is because Mozilla are Mozilla, when they want to get, when they need some new stuff, so there's been a lot of pushes that they've been pushing through with HTML5 and etc. to help and support the Firefox OS project as well and to help that standardization. So in that sense, it's open standard code. Yes. Yeah, and your location, and, and for example, in the implementation of Firefox OS, you GPS location, et cetera, at the lower gong is the same as Android. I guess that's why I chose something that wasn't location as the first question is, <laughs> because I knew that was standardised. Yeah. Um, it is, I just wanted to sort of make half a comment, a half answer question, uh, is that there are some APIs, so for instance, you, want, you might want access to the USB port, which you can get in Android. You can't... Um, get it at the moment. Like there's a bug tracking that for web USB. I think people started making um, a, a start on trying to define that as part of HTML5. But that's something like, I think that's what you were talking about when you say, if you want to add access to lower level things, you could add it to Gonk. And I guess, do you need to define a web IDL for a new um, interface as well? Yes. Yeah, so you're designing, so if we go back into so you do need to design that, that IPDL communication path, yeah. So you'd go, as we said, go into Gonk, you're adding that into Gonk, but you also do need to add and expose those web APIs within Gecko itself, yes. So you need to kind of, it's, it's, yeah, it's part of the parcel. But that's also where, if you're um, interested in looking into it, if you look into the IPDL, um, and if you Google up that on Mozilla, that'll kind of go through and explain it in a little bit more detail as well. And there's quite a lot of white papers and everything out about that. But that is the same way that Firefox, that's what Firefox browser uses, utilizes as well. So hopefully this is a bit more on topic, it's more how it works. Um, in the web apps, I presume some of them have local data stores. Um, like if you're a contact app, you store a whole list. Of oh, I'm not here to talk about web app develop the app development, which is clearly what I put on the on the front of the talk. Is like yeah, this is not a I'm talk not about. I'm going to ask you about <laughs> web development. What this I'm is going a talk about going about, through the architecture. So, yeah. I'm not going to ask you about. What I'm going to ask you about is how does permissions between getting that information go through your stack and the permission manager? So I've created a private data store. I have another app that wants to access that private data. How do you manage the permissions? How do I say app A is allowed to read my contacts, which is managed by app B? Okay, so if we're looking at it, so as we said, here, <coughs> you're actually going through the permission manager in Gecko, and that's where the IPDL process comes into it as well, and the, where we're talking about the newest spawns, parent-child spawns. Oops, wrong one, I've got to put it on here. No. <coughs> so you be everything, the apps, the way it's done is for the app to run with the minimal set of permissions that it needs. So any request like that, if it was going to want to do that, then it would have to go back up to the B2G process and the permission stack would have to then come down through there and then and through the new R process as well. So in a sense, if that if that's not there in the B2G, you're not going to get that access going across to it. So the apps really do, uh, everything's really quite sandboxed and run with a very small set of permissions. Okay. I think that's probably about all time we have for questions, sadly, but uh, Amy will be around, I'm sure people can track yep. you down with. Yep. So, yeah. uh, Hopefully it um, was a little bit worthwhile and sorry for being a little bit rushed on it all, but yeah. Thank you.